I would love to start with soccer. We can't really do that, though, because of the admission last week when you were giving an interview to a Portuguese newspaper where you said <clears throat> Sepp Blatter, who is, was the head of FIFA for a long time, who was corrupt, he's now been suspended for a long time, he's not there now, but he was in power for a long, long time. For people who didn't see the headlines, maybe, do you want to tell them what you told that Portuguese newspaper? What happened? Well, in spite of the times, um, I've been inspired by all of the incredible women in Hollywood who have come out and spoken about their own experiences. And I took some time and I thought about it. And we all know as athletes that it's rampant in the sports world. It happens at every level, from the top down to the bottom, from white powerful men to women, it happens everywhere. And I thought to myself, it is our responsibility to speak out, to take charge, take action, to, cha to make change. And I've been really disappointed in the lack of female ath athletes, especially in the football world, who haven't spoken out. Because we've seen it, we've seen it in the locker room, we've seen it with GMs, we've seen it with coaches, we've seen it with trainers, we've seen it with doctors. And obviously I had an experience with the most powerful man in football at that time, who happens to be a powerful white man. But keep in mind, I don't want that to take away from the fact that it happens all over the place at every level, including amongst teammates. Mm. So it was important to me to speak out. That's really interesting, amongst teammates. I hadn't thought about that. It, you said and you tweeted during the Me Too campaign that it's not just about white men. You said it's about every level. Just expand on that. W where else is this hiding? Well, I think I did expand on it just a second ago. I mean, I've seen it with trainers, doctors, GMs, teammates, um, executives. I mean, it's, it's rampant in sports, and I just hope that more women will speak out. Did you go to U.S. soccer at the time when this happened and Sepp Blatter basically groped you at an award ceremony? Um, did you go to U.S. soccer? Did you want to tell anybody what happened? Um, I take pride in being very upfront with people. Um, I handle things directly for the most part when I can. Um, with that certain circumstance, I, it was right before I went out on stage. I was presenting the biggest award in football for my teammate, Abby Wambach. It was World Player of the Year. And I was taken off guard. I was completely just, you know, just off guard. I mean, I'm about to walk on stage, and I was nervous. And so when I walked on stage, I just gathered myself, and I presented the award. And then I never saw Seth Blatter again. So I, I never confronted him directly. Yeah. What, to U.S. soccer, was it worth it to go to them, the governing body for the U.S. women's national team, to go to them and say, hey, this guy just inappropriately put his hands on me. Well, I've seen complaints um, that have gone through U.S. soccer, whether it's through GMs, whether it's through the coach, um, that have never gone anywhere. And I know on behalf of our team, our captain had made complaints, um, and nothing, just nothing happened. And I finally talked to the head of the PA, the new Players Association attorney, Becca Roo, and I said, what is the plan moving forward? What are we gonna do? What system is in place to make complaints, to complain about your own employer? What are our options available to us? And there was nothing set up. And so I've been working now with the Players Association, making sure there's something set up for players to openly talk about sexual harassment. There was nothing in place. She came back to me and she said, well, there's a 1-800 number that people can call to complain. Wow. And I said, I've been on the team for 20 years. I've never been given a 1-800 number, and I know that none of my teammates know about this 1-800 number. So I guess there was some system in place by U.S. Soccer, but none of the players knew about it. No, I mean, that's insulting. You're one of the best goalkeepers in the world to say that you would have to call a 1-800 number. It's absolutely <laughs> eschewing any kind of responsibility. That is, that's insanity. Now, I have to say, just working in the sports industry for a long time, covering all sports, I noticed a little bit um, of a similarity, I think, with Harvey Weinstein in this way, which is, I'm going to be honest, a lot of people thought this about Sepp Blatter. There were always these kind of just, it was a reputation that he had, not just because in 2004 he said the women should wear tighter uniforms to try to attract a bigger audience. You heard Lee Gallagher say their World Cup win was the most watched soccer game in the United States ever, male, female. So I don't think they need uniforms that are gonna be tighter. But there was that sort of thing where everyone knew that he was just kind of disgusting and a bad guy. I mean, how much did you guys talk about this amongst your own peers? I mean, I'll just go back to what I've been saying this whole time. He's not the only one. I mean, 
it's just part of human culture. It's what we've taught boys growing up. It's what we've accepted as women as part of the norm normalities in the workplace. And you know, I'm guilty as much as anybody else for not doing something sooner. So it's not just to set bladders of the world. Yes, we heard stories about him, but there are so many other executives that worked for FIFA, for US soccer, coaches, trainers, as I said, and even teammates. So we all have to have more of an awareness on our own actions and behaviors. And like I said, you know, it's not just men. Yes, it happens for the most time with men, powerful men, yes. But sexual harassment has been normalized in our society. And I've seen it in the locker room and I've seen young players be very uncomfortable about our own locker room environment, which is not conducive to um, respecting the female anatomy. Um, it, it becomes a locker room similar to a men's locker room in a women's locker room. So we have to be cognizant of, of that as well. We're not innocent either. So like I said, yes, it happened with Seth Blabber, but it is all across the board. I mean, I think we're going to open us up to questions in just a moment, so have them ready. But I think most people would want to say, I mean, how does this change? I know that is a massive question that might not even be able to be answered on this stage. But you've been in the U.S. women's national team system for, what, 17 years, as you said, and you know the ins and outs. What is a step they can take? What are a couple steps to try to eradicate some of this? Well, I mean, I think we all know that creating dialogue is the first step. And... Um, you know, we've been push, pushing for equality and equal pay in women's football. We actually have a lawsuit against our employer, uh, myself and four other teammates we filed going on two years ago with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And that started with just dialogue. It started with us saying, look, we're the best team in the world. We've been the most successful team for the United States Soccer Federation. We brought in $20 million for the Federation in 2016, and the men lost $5 million for the Federation in 2016, yet we're getting paid 25 cents to the dollar. So this isn't just about you know, the, the overall concept of equality. It's also based off of merit. We're bringing in $20 million, and they have a negative loss of, of $5 million. And then you, for, you fast forward to just this year, 2017, ticket sales alone, the women are supposed to bring in $5 million, ticket sales alone and the men are projected to have a negative loss of $1 million. So this started with just conversation. And then suddenly we got the fans behind us, we got the media behind us, we got congressmen and women behind us, we got former President Barack Obama behind us, we got Hillary Clinton behind us. All of a sudden, we had so much support from men and women across the globe. And we're still waiting. Um, to see what happens with our lawsuit. Obviously, the court system takes some time, but like I said, it's been close to two years and we're hoping for a ruling any day now, um, perhaps a settlement. I don't intend to settle for anything short of what is equal because for me, when you file for equal pay, you don't wanna settle for less because it's law. This is, this is American law. This law was passed in 60 years ago, in 1962 or 1963 by John F. Kennedy, and yet we're still pushing to have equal pay. It was passed 60 years ago, but who's going to enforce it? We have to enforce it ourselves. And that's what I've learned is people don't want to give up power. You know, you, you can't just ask nicely for somebody to give up power, whether, whether that's the U.S. Soccer Federation or FIFA or even, you know, the men wanting the women to get paid equally. Nobody wants to give that up. So I always say you have to take it. And it's, sometimes it's an ugly fight. It's not asking to play nice. It's not being agreeable you have to take what is rightfully yours. And like I said, the law was passed 60 years ago. We should open up to questions. Are there any questions? If not, I'll continue on the, okay. Uh, JD from San Francisco Autodesk. Um, I'm wondering what we can do as fans uh, to support what the work that you're doing um, and what are the most effective things we can do uh, because uh, uh, your role model as yourself, your teammates, and your whole team um, is having such a huge impact on young women, um, and even older women who've watched you, not as young women. Um, You're not that so. old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, thank you, first off, because we could use a lot of support, continued support. Um, things have kind of quieted down a little bit since we first passed or filed the lawsuit with the EEOC. I mean, everybody was behind it, and you heard like I said, congressmen and women speaking about it. 
And then things kind of died down, which tends to happen because it's been a two year long process. So we do need to ramp things back up and we need to get the public involved. But it's not just the fans' responsibilities, it's not just the players' responsibilities. I always say there's probably plenty of CEOs in this room and brilliant women and intelligent women. Yet most of the endorsements that go to athletes from companies, they go to men. And I think it's, um, let's see, I think 40% of all athletes in America are women. I think it's 40%. Maybe don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure that's accurate. So let's say 40% of all athletes in America are women. 4% on television is dedicated to women. 4% of the coverage on television is dedicated to women. Who are we to blame? We can't just blame the athletes. We have to blame the CEOs who aren't signing on athletes. We have to blame the media who aren't writing about these incredible athletes. And we have to blame organizations like ESPN, Sports Illustrated, Nike even. I mean, everybody can take part in really bringing the game to more equal, uh, an equal playing field. But it's not just the fans, but we all need to continue to fight for it and support the players and obviously use our platforms and use social media. We can't let it be silenced, which obviously is what the Federation wants to be done. They want it to be us to kind of be quiet. It's why I got fired, is I was the loudest voice to fight for equal pay. Yes, other of my teammates filed the lawsuit, but I helped to bring in the new attorney, um, who was a hard ass, and he wasn't gonna take no for an answer. Um, so I brought in Rich Nichols at the time, and I became the loudest voice. And I was a thorn in my employer's side for about 20 years for better work conditions, better fields, better hotels, first class tickets, better travel to the Olympic Games. And at the end of it, I just was a thorn in their side and they said enough is enough. Well, the new CBA that was ratified earlier this year, collective bargaining agreements, how sports leagues operate, operate outside antitrust laws, it, they got a lot of those things, a lot of equal um, you know, travel and, and some of the smaller things obviously still have the discrimination suit going on with the EEOC. But do you really think that was the only reason why you were, why you were fired, the contract terminated? Because there's to call you polarizing would not be an understatement. You've had a few things and you've been suspended twice by U.S. soccer. Do you think that really was the only reason or was it a combination? I know for a fact it was. I, um, for any of you who aren't aware, I, after we lost um, one of the most humiliating losses in the history of women's football for U.S. soccer, in the Olympics, um, this last Olympics in Rio, we played Sweden, and they had a very conservative style of play, very defensive style of play, and at the end of the game, I'm pissed, I'm hurt, I'm angry. And I always say, it's okay to be passionate. I mean, it's okay to have a deep desire to win. You look at, you look at men's post-game interviews, <laughs> they're oftentimes not that dissimilar to my interview I had after the game with Sweden. I called them cowards, um, which is very, unsportsmanlike, and I get back to the hotel, and I have a meeting with the captain of the Swedish national team, and I said, Lota Hulin, one of the best players in the world, I said, look, you know I would never mean to disrespect you, and I'm sorry, and I don't really think you guys are cowards. And she goes, hope, 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 you have nothing to apologize for, don't worry. She's like, honestly, we knew that we would never beat the number one team in the world unless we played a very defensive style of play. She knew it, she knew that it wasn't part of the Olympic spirit. The Olympic spirit is about putting your best foot forward, taking chances, wanting to win, having that deep desire and passion to win. The world wants to see that, but they didn't play with that deep desire to win. They were playing not to lose, and to me that's against the Olympic spirit. So after that happened, um, you know, I spoke to Sunil Galati, the president of US Soccer, that same night, um, I flew home with the head coach, Jill Ellis, on the same flight, going back to America the next day as losers. And Jill and I had a long talk on the plane, and she's like, Hope, this is what we need to win the 2019 World Cup. We need you in goal. We need you to lead the team. I heard about your comments calling Sweden cowards. Just apologize on Twitter or something. It's no big deal. We need, to, we need to get back and make sure that we're the best team in the world, and we need you in goal to do that. She didn't want to fire me. She didn't want to fire me. I, I was the leading voice for equal pay, for better treatment of the women for 20 years, and they got sick and tired of me. Unfortunately, we're up. Our time is up. I'm so sorry <laughs> about that. Hope Solo is fantastic. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you, Hope. Okay.